Praise the Lord. We are getting ready. May the Lord prepare every one of us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege once again to come to study your word. Thank you for the revelation you are giving us in this book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we talk about the coming of the Lord today, you help us to get ready in Jesus' name. That when the Lord shall come, none of us, members of the church, workers in the church, leaders in the church, everyone, none of us will be left behind in Jesus' name. Teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We've been looking at Revelation chapter 1. And Revelation chapter 1, we've covered already verses 1, 2, and 3, the first message. Verses 4, 5, and 6, the second message. And if you are listening to this message on cassette, and this is the only copy you have, and there is still, you know, there are two others who have preached already. Make effort to get the cassette, because they go on in a series. And I'll still be doing another one after this. I don't just buy a piece, buy the whole set. Today we're looking at verses 7 and 8 of Revelation chapter 1. Please open your Bible. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And says the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. As we look at the certainty of Christ's second coming today, you need to understand that this is a sublime, climactic announcement of the greatest event of the program of God for the church, and the program of God for Israel, and the program of God for the world. And this verse 7 begins by saying, Behold! And John actually, he, he was excited. And then, not only that, he, he suspended every other thing. There is something to look at. There is something to consider. There is something to be excited about. The expectation of the people of God all through the ages until this time. Behold, and actually 30 times in the book of Revelation, there were things that happened that John did not have any other way to express it expect, except just to say, Behold, look at this. This is a great event. This is the fulfillment of the great expectation of the people of God. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. This actually, the coming of the Lord, is the theme of the book of Revelation. Everything in the book is pointing to and moving towards Christ's coming again. Have you noticed seven times? How the second coming of the Lord is specifically mentioned. Number one, behold, he cometh. Chapter one, verse seven. Number two, hold fast till I come. Revelation chapter two, verse 25. Three, behold, I come quickly. Revelation chapter three, verse 11. Number four, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. And then now number 5. Behold, I come quickly. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Number 6. Behold, I come. He said, surely. Behold, I come quickly. Repeating it again. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Now number 7. Surely, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 20. 
And you will see then that this coming of the Lord takes an important place. I told you yesterday the importance, the significance, and the symbolic nature of the number seven. And seven times here, the Lord saying in this book, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I am coming, I am coming. And when he says that repeatedly seven times, it's sure is a perfection of the certainty, of the fulfillment, of the expectation that Jesus Christ will definitely and surely come. Here is the first prophetic announcement in the book of Revelation. Behold, he cometh. Revelation 1, 7. And it is the last prophetic declaration in the book of Revelation. Surely, I come quickly. If the first declaration, prophetic, is behold, I come. And the very last prophetic revelation is, Behold, I come. Then you understand about the certainty that this Jesus will definitely come. Actually, when you pick up the Bible, the Bible is a book that contains a lot of prophecies. And prophecy means the future prediction of coming events. And prophecy alone takes up one feast of the scriptures. As you go through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, one feast of the scriptures touch on prophecy. And then one third of all the prophecies of the Bible refers to the second coming of Christ. There are over 660 general prophecies. And then you have 333 talking about Christ. Of the 333 prophecies concerning Christ, particularly 109 were fulfilled at his first coming. And it remains 224 prophecies concerning Christ still to be fulfilled at his second coming. That shows you then the importance of the prophecy concerning relating to Christ. Of the 46 Old Testament prophets, please listen, I didn't say 46 books of the Old Testament. There are only 39 books of the Old Testament. But of the 46 Old Testament prophets, less than 10 of them spoke about his first coming. Think about this now. While 36 of them spoke about his second coming. How important then is the second coming of the Lord. There are over 1,500 Old Testament passages referring to the second coming of Christ. Come on to the New Testament. As you come to the New Testament, one out of every 25 New Testament verses directly refers to the second coming of Christ. Do you know that if you make comparison for every time the Bible mentions the first coming of Christ, it mentions the second coming of Christ eight times. For every time the whole Bible mentions the first coming of Christ, that same Bible mentions the second coming eight times. Jesus Christ himself refers to his second coming 21 times. And then in the New Testament, 50 times we're told to be ready, as the choir just told us now, to be ready for his return. Christ's second coming is a major theme in the word of God. It does the reason it befits us to consider, as we are considering, the certainty of Christ's second coming. The message is divided into three parts. Part one, the glory of Christ's second coming.
coming, the glory. The glory of Christ's second coming. Number two, gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. On the one hand, gladness, joy, happiness. On the other hand, sorrow, sadness, gloominess. But two, gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. And then, number three, God's guarantee of Christ's second coming. God's guarantee of Christ's second coming. Come back to number one. The glory of Christ's second coming. In Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading the first part of verse 7. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. That's the glory. The glory of the coming of the Son of God. He came first in humiliation. He's coming again in glorification. He came first to sacrifice. He's coming again and he's going to reign. And it says, look at this. Behold this. Suspend every other activity and pay attention to this. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And everybody that ever saw the coming of the Lord, even in prophecy, even in, 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 in anti Anticipation of the coming of the Lord. They have always been excited like that in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 13. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not be, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The glory of the second coming of Christ is coming of the clouds and is coming in power and is coming in majesty and is coming to reign. Even Jesus Christ himself, he made mention of it in the Olivet Discourse when he was talking to his own disciples as to uh, the second coming that he will come again in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. A special sign. A special sign. A sign that belongs not to angel, belongs not to man, belongs not to any other creature. This is a special sign belonging to the Son. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. In Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Reading there in verse 31. 25. 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Do you see the glory associated or the second coming of Christ, every time we read about it, it says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, glory again, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep, from the goats. And then we, if you look at Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Mark 8, verse 38. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels so you see then the glory of christ's second coming when he comes he's going to come in glory and everywhere old testament new testament they assure us that christ is coming again and when he comes he's not going to come in humiliation he's going to come in exaltation and glory in mark chapter 13 mark 13 verse 26 mark 13 26 and then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory then shall shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven don't you see that glorious thing that the lord is coming and is coming is coming again and so john said behold the comet of the clouds in luke everybody is talking about it luke chapter 21 in luke chapter 21 we see him still coming and we're told that he's going to come in glory luke 21 verse 25 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring and then it says in verse 26 men start failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the earth shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to come to pass then look up lift up your heads for your redemption israel your redemption draweth near uh, you know that all these things we're reading about has not happened yet when he came the first time he didn't come with clouds when he came the first time he came quietly in the manger he came quietly in bethlehem he came quietly in israel and they didn't even know that he was there until those wise men from the east they saw the star and they came they were they were the people that put the city into consternation and stirring up but when he comes next time it will not be quietly like that in humiliation born in a manger it will be he'll be coming in the clouds of glory and then in colossians chapter 3 colossians chapter 3 reading there from verse 4 colossians chapter 3 verse 4 when christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory you see the association of the coming of the lord every time with glory 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 every time second thessalonians chapter one verse seven second thessalonians one seven and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and they that, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, everlasting separation from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day in that day when he comes he will come with great glory in first peter chapter 4 first peter chapter 4 there in verse 7 
It says in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Then in verse 13, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He's coming again. I said he's coming again. Well, the, the coming of the Lord is important. And there are many things that point to the coming of the Lord. There are things, many, many things that demand that Christ must come again. Number one, the promise of God demands that Christ will come again. Back in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, the Lord promised that he will come and he will rule. That has not happened yet. That promise of God demands that he comes again. In Psalm 2 verse 8 verse 9, ask of me and I will give you the nations and you will rule them with the rod of iron. That promise of God demands that he comes again. He came before the first time. That has not happened. Number two, the words of Jesus Christ himself demand that he returns. Because he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. Those words of Jesus Christ demand that he will come again. Number three, the program for the church demands that he comes again because Christ has a program for the church and this program of the church demands that at the climax at the culmination of the program of the church that Christ has to come therefore there, there is no way to escape that prophecy of his coming it says, be patient, therefore, brethren, James 5, 7, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive his early and, and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The, uh, the program of the Lord for the church demands that he will come again. Number four, the program of the Lord for the nations also demand that Christ has to come again. It's in Joel chapter 3 where Joel told the people gather yourself and gather in that valley of decision and then all the nations will gather and Jesus Christ himself said when he comes, he'll gather the nations together and some to the right and some to the left. And then he will tell those on the right, go into the Father's kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. And then to those on the left hand side, depart from me, ye cursed. And when you think about the program of God for the nations, that program of the Lord for the nations demands that Christ must come again. Number five the program of the Lord for Israel. God has not finished with Israel. And the program of the Lord for Israel demands that Christ must come again. And when you think about all the things that are still waiting, that still must be done before the coming of the Lord, then you know that Christ really has to come. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 20 and 21. Isaiah 59, 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. Unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. 
As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. He has a program for Israel. Israel has not come to this situation yet. They have not responded fully to the Messiah, to the Redeemer, to the Savior yet. The program of the Lord for Israel demands that Christ must come again. Number six, the humiliation of Christ demands that he must come again. See how they took him, the Son of God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and he put the cross on him, and he fell under that cross. See how they took him and they spit on him. See how they humiliated him. You think that will be the last treatment and the last view that the world will see of Christ the King? No, the humiliation of Jesus Christ demands that he comes again so that they will know that the person they treated like that is not an ordinary person is the king of kings and the lord of lords number seven the expectation of the saints as you see the saints passing through persecution as you see the saints that the bible says the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof and we are the children of our Father in heaven. And we, who are the children of God, see how we are persecuted. And see how we are treated. And see how we are in the world. And we are asking, is this how it's going to be? And then he said that we are going to reign with him. And, and we're in a hurry. And we're groaning. And we're mourning. And we're saying, Lord, where will it be? There is a great expectation of the church that the way we king's kids, king's sons and daughters, the way we are treated now, we are expecting that there will be something different. There will be a change. The expectation of the saints of God demands that Christ will come again and the Lord will come. Amen. He is coming again. When Christ came to this world the first time, the world saw him in humiliation. When he comes again, the second time, we'll see him in his exaltation and glory. He will come in the clouds of glory, heavenly glory, indescribable glory. The glory of the coming of our Lord Jesus has no parallel in history. When those three disciples, you remember, when they went to the Mount of Trans Transfiguration, and they saw in that holy mount, when they saw his face, that he became radiant like the sun. And his raiment became shining exceedingly white like snow. And he said, we beheld his glory and his majesty when we were with him on the mount. Peter, James, John, that's nothing. Compared with what is coming, because the glory... At his second coming will be incomparably greater, infinitely more magnificent and majestic. Imagine now, imagine, imagine Christ coming with the blazing light of a million suns. I mean, S U N. The sun up there now will be darkened, and the moon will turn to blood, and everything will be dark. And then Jesus will come in the glory, in the blazing light of a million suns. And everywhere will be very, very bright. Not only that, he'll be coming with 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands of angels that are white and blazing with blazing glory. See, when everywhere is dark and the sun is turned to darkness, and the moon turns to blood, and, then, and nobody can see anything, and everybody looks up like this, and then they can't see anything, no star, no moon, no sun, everywhere is black. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ, in the blazing glory of a million suns, just 
brightens up immediately. Everybody will see that immediately. And you'll know that something is coming. And then, you see, when you see those angels, thousands and thousands and thousands of them in white over there, and then the saints of God having white linen, the white linen being the righteousness of the saints, and you have millions and millions and billions of those uh, saints of God in white. When you look at that, up like that, it will look like a cloud a cloud of glory and then they will see the captain and they will see the conqueror and they will see the mighty one and they will see the king of kings as he leads that array of angels and redeemed men and then everybody will realize immediately and then they begin to know they begin to remember what they did against him and they begin to mourn he will come he will come he will come Old Testament, New Testament, they tell us is coming. The prophets and the apostles and the preachers, they tell us is coming. Christ and his Father, God in heaven, they tell us is coming again. And the heart and the faith of the believers, they remind us is coming again. Everything, all the events of the world right now, pointing to the very fact that Jesus is coming again. And I pray that you will be ready when he comes in Jesus' name. Point number two, gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. Gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, behold, he cometh over the clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth, all the tribes of the earth, all the peoples of the earth shall wail because of him. When Christ comes again, his coming will be visible to the entire human race. This time, the world will recognize. They'll recognize him. The first time he came, in his, his glory was veiled. His glory was covered. But at his second coming, his glory, his splendor, his majesty will be visible. And those who will see him, that is, those who will see Christ, as he descends in clouds of glory, they are divided into two groups. Group one, they which pierced him. Who are those? That's Israel. Those are the Jews. That's the first group. The people that pierced him, the Israelites, they will see him. Group two, all the kindreds of the earth who are those the gentiles some will be glad while others will be sorrowful and those who are sorrowful they shall wail because of him the first group those who pierced him referring to the jews referring to the israelites they're still expecting the messiah they didn't know that he had come the first time. And they're still looking for him. And it's when he comes the second time, they will now recognize when he comes in glory. And as we study the book of Revelation, you notice something. That during the period of the great tribulation, many of those Jews will get saved. And they'll be looking for the return of Christ. And when he eventually comes these people during the tribulation among the jews who have actually been saved and you will find that they will be crying to the lord wailing to the lord and uh, tears of joy tears of regret that they didn't take him at the first time look at zechariah zechariah chapter 12 reading from verse 10 Zechariah 12, 10. 
And I will pour upon the house of David, the Israelites, the Jews, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. I'll pour upon them the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon him whom they are pierced. That means this time of pouring the spirit of grace and supplication upon them is not before the cross. It's not the first time that Jesus came. It will be after because it says they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him. That is, they'll be regretting now. Remember, now they have grace. Now they'll have supplication and he'll be talking to the Lord and it's like they're saying we're glad we're glad eventually that we can see the light we're glad eventually we could be recipients of the grace of God we're glad eventually we can make supplication we're glad eventually that our hearts are sorted we're glad eventually we recognize the Messiah but how sorrowful we are that we were ignorant when he came the first time and we pierced him and we crucified him and then there will be mourning as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn in that day in verse 11 shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of a, had a dream had a dream on in the body of Megiddon and the land shall mourn every family apart the family of the house of david apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of nathan apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of levi apart and their wives apart and the family of uh, shimei apart and their wives apart and all the families that remain every family apart and their wives apart they'll mourn we're sorry we're sorry we regret that we ever did that but eventually they'll be joyful that now god himself has poured upon them the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication in that same zechariah that same zechariah reading chapter 13 in verse 1 zechariah chapter 13 verse 1 in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of david and to the inhabitants of jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness that is a fountain will be open and then their sins will be cleansed the uncleanness will be taken away in verse 6 and one shall say unto him what are these wounds in thine hand hey, they, they, they'll be so free with the savior with the redeemer with the coming king and they will get near they will embrace him they will love him they'll begin to ask him what are these wounds in thine hands then he shall answer those with which i was wounded in the house of my friends 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 they'll be united with him they will love him. They'll be sorry for what they did before. And they'll be asking him, how did you sustain all this injury? And then he'll be telling them. And they will gather around him. Glorious day. Glorious day. When Christ will come. And Israel will accept the Lord Jesus Christ. May that day come quickly. In verse 9. And I will bring that third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they shall call on my name and i will hear them and i will say it's my people israel the people that rejected the lord the day will come when christ will come again and then God himself will say, it's my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. That day is coming, I pray. It will come quickly in Jesus' name. But in Isaiah chapter 25, 
Isaiah chapter 25. We're reading there from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 25. Reading there from verse 9. Isaiah 5, 9. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. They didn't know when he came the first time. And for thousands of years now they have been waiting. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I pray that, you know, you that have the opportunities now, when he comes, you will not be among the people here on earth. You will have gone with him. And then I told you there are two groups. The other group will be the group of the Gentiles, the people that still hate him and reject him. And we're told in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, from verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us hide us from the face of him that seateth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the day for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand those are the, uh, that's the second group, the other side, the people that will mourn, the people that, you know, the people that have rejected him. And they have rejected until that very day, until that final day. While Israel is mourning and wailing in repentance, multitudes of the Gentile nations will be mourning and wailing in terror and in fear of judgment. The second coming of Christ will spell the doom and the inescapable judgment of impenitent, hardened sinners. The sudden realization of the coming wrath of the Lamb as he appears in glory will make them to mourn and to wail in fear and anguish. On the one hand, gladness for the redeemed. On the other hand, gloominess for the rebellious. Point number three. God's guarantee of Christ's second coming. Hey, come back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 and verse 8. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and he also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth will, they shall will because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. You see that verse 8 is confirming what we have read in verse 7. Jesus is coming again. And John was so excited about the announcement of Christ's second coming. And he responded and he said, even so, amen. You need to understand, actually, when John the beloved heard that, that behold, he cometh with the clouds, every eye shall see him even the people that pierced him they will see him and all the kindreds of the earth they'll see him they'll well because of him you know what john what john did he couldn't contain himself he used hebrew and greek at the same time he used two languages hebrew greek to make the affirmation and those two words mean yes yes they mean, even so, amen. They mean, do it, let it be. You know, when John heard about the coming of the Lord, his excitement got him into two languages. On the one hand, the Jews, he used Hebrew for them. On the other hand, the Gentiles, he used Greek for them. And he said, the Lord is coming. Hebrew people, even so, Amen. Yes, let it be. 
Greek people, gentle people, did you hear that this Christ is coming and is coming again? Even so, amen, yes, let it be, it will be. And so the Lord is coming. At, at the very end of the revelation, John had not lost the excitement and the expectation concerning the coming of the Lord. As the Lord said, the very final chapter, surely I come quickly, he immediately responded again, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. As he was excited and thrilled, so should we be thrilled and excited about the announcement of the affirmation of the coming of the Lord. Now, this verse 8, look at it. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Here is God Almighty himself assuring us of the announcement that was made in verse 7. Telling us of the certainty of the coming of the Lord. And he gives us three of his attributes to confirm that nothing, nothing can hinder, can alter, can derail the plan, the program of the coming of of the Lord. One is omniscience. Is omniscience. I am Alpha and Omega. What's that? The first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What's the alphabet for? And the alphabet is a marvelous way of storing and communicating all knowledge. Like, for example, in English, all the 26 alphabets, any word you want to write, in fact, almost uncountable number of words, they are composed with those alphabets. The alphabets give us the knowledge, stores the knowledge, relates the knowledge, reveals the knowledge. And God says, I know all things. I am the alphabet of all knowledge and I'm confirming as the omniscient one that this my son is coming again and I'm communicating that to you the knowledge of the omniscient one the knowledge of the alpha and the omega declares to us Christ is coming again even so amen number two the omnipresence of God which is which was, which is to come. He says, I am present everywhere. There is nothing in any corner of the earth that can hinder this plan, this program of the coming of the Lord. The eternally existent one, the eternally present, present God affirms, confirms that he is always there. He is never on vacation. There is nothing before him. There is nothing after him. He was, he is, he will ever be. And the one that knows all things, and the one that is present everywhere to detect and to deal with anything that will hinder the coming of the Lord, he says, I am behind it. I am affirming it. I am confirming it that this Christ, my only begotten son, is coming again. Christ will come again. Number three, we have the omnipotence of God. The omnipotence of God. Because it says, the almighty. The almighty. Because of his power, whatever he plans, nothing can hinder it. The all-powerful God is able to crush all opposing forces, all opposing powers that will hinder the coming of the Lord. And it says, me, the omniscient one, knowing all things, 
the omnipresent one, present everywhere, watching everything, supervising everything. The almighty, the omnipotent one. I'm standing here, I'm declaring, I'm affirming that this my son. I've given him the kingdom. And I've given him to rule. And he's going to rule on all the earth. He is with me over here now sitting by the throne. He is coming. Get ready. He is coming. The Almighty then confirms that this plan and project of the coming of the Lord, nothing will hinder it. And he affirms that Christ is coming again. See, God affirms his coming. The angels affirm his coming. The redeemed soul affirm his coming. The singers tell us he's coming and they tell us to be ready. He will come. Will you be there? Even so. Amen. Rise up and let's pray.